Greetings, comrades! Today we are going to talk about a simple Soviet dream of a simple Soviet man. Or more precisely, about one third of this dream. There were three things that were considered indicators of success in the USSR. An individual apartment, a dacha and a car. But apartments were distributed by the state. Garden plots for dachas often could be obtained only through your workplace. So the money could only buy you a part of the Soviet dream. A car. But if you think you could just walk into a nearest Soviet car dealership, choose from a dozen Soviet cars, pay for your purchase in Soviet rubles and drive it back to your Soviet home happily, you are severely mistaken. Today I will tell you what difficulties and trials a citizen of the USSR had to go through in order to become an owner of a masterpiece of the Soviet car industry. A Soviet car and a Soviet man are a match made in heaven. At least that's what Soviet car commercials tried to convince us of. But let's think, what do you need today in order to buy a car? Money and willingness. Speaking of money and willingness, if you wish to financially support the channel, you can do so by subscribing to my Patreon or in some other ways. All links are in the description below. So, if you found yourself in the USSR in the middle of the 20th century with the right amount of money and the right amount of willingness to buy a car, you would probably not be able to do it. Although formally the free sale of cars into private hands began in the USSR in 1948. It was then that the first specialized auto store was opened in Moscow under the very creative name Automobiles. The choice was the Moskvich 400, the Gaz 20 Pobeda and the Zim the main symbol of Soviet luxury. Except that the population had no money after the war, so nobody really needed these cars, and the streets of Moscow were beautiful and empty, unlike today. However, by the 60s the situation with money has recovered, and only luxurious Zim were available in stores, because they were insanely expensive. To buy anything else, you had to go through seven circles of hell. There were several ways to buy a new car in the Soviet Union, none of which could be called easy. People having outstanding achievements for the state were given the right to buy a car without waiting in line at a preferential price, two three times lower than usual, and sometimes even as a gift from the state. But for this you had to be someone like Yuri Gagarin or Sergei Korolev, or at least a polar explorer of international renown. So that option was for a select few. What should ordinary people do? First, choose which model they want. A prestigious Volga, Pobeda, Moskvich, or maybe a Zaporozhets would be enough. However, the Gaz 24 Volga could be immediately crossed out. These cars could only be bought by those citizens who were somehow close to the government. Most of the Volgas were used as official cars for the executives, special services or army generals, as well as in cabs, oddly enough. However, there is an explanation for this. Taxes were not an everyday thing for ordinary people back then. Ordinary people who wanted to buy a car had to stand in a huge line. And I don't mean the physical line at the store, but the virtual queue. You go to your union office and say, I want a car. And they put you in line with thousands of other people who also want to buy a car. Then it's all dependent on your workplace, and also on how worthy a Soviet citizen and employee you were. However, if a person was not a drunkard, a truant, and had some kind of work experience at that very enterprise, he was put in line. And then you just… wait. According to statistics, the average waiting time for the right to buy a car was from 7 to 10 years. As a rule, a medium-sized factory had a quota of, say, 5 or 6 cars a year. One Volga, a couple of Moskvichs, three Zaporozhets, while there were several hundred applications. As a result, every single time the party committee, the trade union committee and the administration had to make a list of the most worthy. Roughly speaking, the Gaz 21 goes to the deputy director, the Moskvichs go to the head of an important department and the most prominent labor union activist, and the Zaporozhets go to free war and labor veterans. Is everyone happy? Well, not that they were happy, but there was no choice. After all, even if you are very lucky, you had to wait three years or more for a simple Moskvich. 
and you don't get a car for free, you still have to pay an impressive sum of money for it. In the mid 1960s you had to pay 6000 rubles for a Volga, 4.5 for a Moskvich and 2000 for a Zaporozhets. The average salary was about 100 rubles a month. The sum was not insurmountable, but you had to save for years or raise money from the whole extended family. Funny thing is that when Lada, which in the USSR was called Zhiguli, first appeared on the market, people did not really trust the new thing, and so in the early years it was even slightly easier to acquire it than the Moskvich. But things quickly changed, Zhiguli became much more prestigious and scarce. So you are in line for a car. And what do you need to do now? You have to go to a post office and send a postcard. Yes, a strange thing to do, but who are we to judge? That same postcard with the right stamps will be sent back to you one day, in a year, two years, ten years, and then you have to grab all your fat stacks of money and head to the nearest big city, to the store, to get your new shiny car. There you have to stand in line for a whole day too. First in line for the delivery note for the car, then in line to pay at the cash desk, then in line to receive the cars from the warehouse. By the end of the day, the variety of cars brought from the factory to that warehouse was usually over, so there was no option to choose any color. Grab whatever's available. By the way, while these 5, 7, 10 years were going on, people in the waiting lists had to check in periodically, come to a special roll call and confirm their intention to still buy a car. If you missed it, you were crossed out. There were just too many people waiting, so even if you are lying in a body casting hospital, be ready to get to the roll call location. By the way, the interesting thing about the whole postcard system was that you could sign up to buy one model of car, and the postcard could come to you with an invitation to buy another model. For example, a more budget Kapeika instead of VAS 2106. Of course, you could refuse and continue to wait for your turn for the desired model, but when will it arrive? So people took what they could. But the saddest were the opposite stories, when people had been waiting for their Kapeikas for 5 years and received a postcard for 2106 and just had no money for it. And it was impossible to swap with anyone, all cards were personal. Well, unless one was able to make an agreement with some employee of the car store, of course. Well, you could make a deal at any stage of this process. Make a deal to get in the right place in the right line, Make a deal so that the line moves faster for you than for others. Make a deal so that you can choose a specific model and color. If you know who to negotiate with and are willing to pay a certain amount to the right people. Or if you are a relative of the right people who are in charge of the line. That is the kind of Soviet-style fairness. However, if you are allergic to lines, postcards and other delights of Soviet life, you still had a chance to get a car. Even three different chances. One slightly more legal, one slightly less and one if you believed in lady luck. First of all, in the USSR there was a lottery, according to the results of which you could get a gas 24. All lottery tickets were sold by the state and were subject to very strict accounting. In addition, in the USSR you could just go and buy a car without waiting in line, even the most prestigious, scarce and therefore the most adored Volga. And there were even colorful advertising pamphlets about it. It was possible to buy a car, as well as other scarce goods, without waiting in line, just not with ordinary rubles, but with some parallel money. Vnesh Pasil Tork checks. I've already told you about this alternative Soviet currency. Citizens who had worked abroad and received their wages in foreign currency could exchange them back home for this very parallel special money. And with it you could buy anything you want in special Berezka stores. Anything that you could not buy in ordinary stores. Even a car. It would seem to be the perfect breeding ground for the black market. But no. You could not buy these checks with regular Soviet rubles. Theoretically you could, but the stores would demand proof that you acquired this special money legally. This is why the most convenient and also the most expensive way to buy a car in the USSR was to buy it on the used car market. And yes, they were even more expensive than the exact same new cars, simply because you didn't have to wait in line at all. You come to Moscow to the Yuzhny port district, walk among the cars on display there, choose one, bargain with the owner and drive home in your own ladder. There were two ways to sell your car in such places. Officially you could just leave it there and the site would sell it for you, for a fee. 
But this method deprived you as a seller of a large part of the possible profit. The second way was less official. The site staff for a certain amount of money could introduce you to a potential buyer, so you two could personally negotiate the sum of the deal. This method was often used by those who did not want to disclose their unofficial income in the official documents. However, there was also a risk there. The transaction was conducted on pure trust, because after the transfer of money the seller could simply not give the car to the buyer, and the buyer after signing the documents could refuse to hand over the money. And you can't go to the police, the transfer of money between private individuals bypassing the state is a crime. But the desire to own their own cars was often so overwhelming that people willingly accepted the risks of such shady deals. That would have been your path if you had decided to become a car owner in the Soviet Union. Pretty complicated, as you may have noticed. But the desire to become one step closer to the Soviet dream has always been stronger. Which is why people waited in lines for years, bought lottery tickets or made risky deals with suspicious individuals. In fact, partly because of this complex system, cars never ceased to be a luxury and did not become a common means of transport in the USSR. At the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were 59 cars per thousand residents. This is six times less than in contemporary Russia, and about 12 times less than in the United States in the same years. Yes, there were just not a lot of cars in the USSR. But that made an ordinary Moskvich even more valuable. Really, for every ordinary Soviet worker, getting a car after 10 years of faithful service to the Soviet state was a dream coming true. Thanks for watching, and a shout out to my biggest supporters Stick221, Steven, Elizaveta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zeman Berze, and Giovanni Zayas. See you next time!